Hi, this is Long. Welcome to our video series on search patterns for the most common studies in radiology. Please note that this is an introduction to study interpretation. An enormous amount of detail is omitted for brevity. Continue dedicated reading, seeing as many cases as possible, and keep getting feedback from subspecialists during the course of your training. All right, today we're going to talk about an approach to the MRI cervical spine. Um, as a brief outline, uh, like any other study, you're going to get a sense of the overall patient context, indication for the study, and as an approach to the cervical spine, we'll first take a look at everything outside the spinal anatomy itself, looking at the incidentally image, uh, lower aspect of the head, the upper uh, thorax, the soft tissues, paravertebral, prevertebral soft tissues, and you have to be careful to look at the localizers for those. Then we're going to look at the STIR images uh, for edema and injury, any sort of abnormal fluid signal, and then correlating between the different sequences, but primarily looking at the T2s, we're going to take a look at the spinal anatomy, including alignment, abnormalities of morphology, any injury changes in vertebral body height, things like that, and then eventually as assess for degeneration, stenosis, um, or any sort of spinal stenosis that results from abnormalities that we're seeing. Lastly, I like to look at the intraspinal anatomy, including the CF CSS spaces surrounding spinal cord and the cord signal. If we're looking at a pre and post contrast study, then that is when I will typically look at the uh, post contrast images in a dedicated fashion. Again, at every step, we're going to correlate between the different sequences to do any sort of problem solving that we need. All right, so let's just begin taking a look at what we have to do for the cervical spine. So once you've done your usual you know, homework, so to speak, and take, understanding the patient context, where I like to start is basically an outside-in approach. Again, looking at everything outside the usual spinal anatomy first, I like to start with the localizers and basically try and look at, particularly at the top and bottom and the periphery of the study. Um, you'll notice that there are parts of the upper chest, the lungs, mediastinum, the shoulders that we're going to see on some of these localizer images. We just want to make sure that there are no um, incidentally seen mass lesions, uh, especially at the edges, the corners of, the, of these localizer images that we can go by quickly. I'll do the same on the um, obtained uh, sagittal and axial images going through the anatomy and just being particularly careful of the skull base. Note that you can see the cell of the posterior fossa, portions of the paranasal sinuses, the facial structures, oral and nasal cavities. You can see the whole air digester tract here. And you'll see that on the stir, you know, T2, you've got also the T1 to help you with fat planes. And if you have a post contrast uh, set of images, which we don't, I'm not taking a look at here, you can see abnormal enhancement. And note that the axial and sagittal images are can provide different different um, fields of view. So here you can actually, we can see a little bit of the right uh, maxillary sinuses filled in. Um, it's got some abnormal signal there. Um, but just note that you're, you can see a lot. You're going to see, you know, frequently you're going to see nodules in the thyroid gland. Okay. You can see the whole of the vasculature here. Um, you can follow that down um, into the upper chest. All right. So just make sure we're looking at each of those in, in turn. And then once you've gotten a good sense that you've at least taken a look at the um, extraspinal anatomy, then I'll move on to the actual spine itself. Um, and usually I like to lay all the sagittal images together and all the axial images together. We've got the STIR T2 and T1 post contrast here. STIR is going to give you an abnormal fluid signal. Um, so I'm going to take a look at this and particularly look at you know, if we haven't already looked at paraspinal soft tissue, I'm going to look for any muscular edema. And then I'm going to look for um, any abnormal fluid signal in the prevertebral soft tissues along the ligaments, anterior, posterior, spinal, lamellar, posterior elements um, between the spinous processes as well. I'm going to look for abnormal marrow edema along all the osseous structures, including at the skull base, the incidentally imaged facial structures, along the vertebral bodies, along the facets, along the posterior elements. Okay, and be particularly careful also to look at the disc spaces. All right, um, you may see any sort of marrow edema there. And again, we're going to correlate this across the different sequences. But but the stir and that abnormal fluid signal is going to be particularly helpful to look for infection, for inflammation, for acute injury. You know, you're also going to see some. Uh, stir signal associated with abnormal marrow placement if it's from a metastatic process or other infiltrative process. Um, once you've gotten a sense of that, which in, in my mind is kind of the category of often acute findings, we're going to I'm going to use primarily the T2 uh, sagittals to get a sense of the spinal anatomy that I haven't already, you know, uh, incidentally noticed on the stir. So here we're looking for again alignment, anterior, posterior, uh, longitudinal lines, spinal lamellar, 
uh, supraspinous, and just make sure those line up well. There's no abnormal esthesis. There's no evidence of traumatic esthesis. And um, we're going to compare that to prior if we're, we are finding anything. Um, I'm also going to look at the vertebral body heights as usual, and that's kind of useful to scroll back and forth to do that, and also look at normal kind of um, alignment and morphology of the facets and posterior elements. All right, uh, we're going to ch check to see that there's um, normal, uh, you know, not just normal vertebral body heights, but we're going to take a look at the, uh, the disc bases. Um, and then for any sort of abnormalities, we're going to, you know, and, 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 and kind of uh, completely separate to anything we've previously found, we're going to take a look at the T1 uh, pre-contrast images. And this is particularly good for, for fat planes outside of the spinal spinous anatomy. But when it comes to the osteostructures, we're going to look for preservation of usual marrow signal. And marrow signal, we want that uh, pre-contrast uh, signal to be above muscle or disc. I usually rely on muscle because discs can have, you know, differing signal based on degeneration. Um, so you're basically looking for vocal or diffuse marrow placement. And again, uh, it's important to look not just at the vertebral bodies, but the skull based incidentally imaged facial structures, the facets, the lateral aspects here of the vertebral bodies, um, the posterior elements, and even you're going to see some of the thoracic cage at the bottom aspect of the study. All right. Um, once having taken a look at that, you can get a sense of overall, you know, the, the overall layout of any sort of pathologic process. Um, you can also get a sense as to, you know, uh, any sort of encroachment on the spinal canal and uh, and uh, mass effect on the spinal cord. But to really kind of sort those things out, it's best to look at the axial sequences. We have like a kind of a, you know, what we have called a medic or like a, but this is primarily like a GRE sort of sequence and then a... Um, uh, kind of conventional T2 axial. Um, and because of the way that the uh, nerve foramina are set up in the cervical spine, so they don't come out straight laterally, but they're a little bit uh, angled anteriorly, it's it's difficult on the sagittal sequences to get a sense of any uh, nerve foraminal stenosis. So once we've gotten a sense of the overall extent of spine uh, pathology or degeneration, you're going to want to go level by level and correlating the axials uh, uh, and the sagittals, you want to take a look at any sort of encroachment on the spinal canal and on the nerve foramina. With the spinal canal often frequently best demonstrated um, on the coronals, and then you can correlate with the axials, but then really the extent of encroachment on the nerve foramina can be best demonstrated on, on the axials. You have to kind of take a look at the relative contributions of, you know, frequently dysosified complexes, um, uncovertebral joint hypertrophy, facet arthropathy, and then more on kind of uncommon um, processes, um, whether post-traumatic, infiltrative, or mass lesions that, that occur. And then in addition to seeing the um, the impact of those pathologies on the spinal canal and nerve foramina, we're going to, you want to assess whether it, um, any of these processes uh, produce mass effect on exiting nerve roots, on the thecal, uh, on the um, spinal cord. Okay. And then in assessing the intraspinal anatomy or the kind of um, the spinal canal, the last uh, typical um, step that I will do is to look at the cord uh, signal. And, and this is one of the best things to do here is to, to make this nice and big and to window it down and, and scroll through and see if there's any sort of uh, clear cord signal abnormality. This is frequently d best done on axial images um, uh, as Especially, you know, you, it's very difficult to trust or, or to sort out whether any sort of signal you're seeing on the sagittal images, particularly, you know, the stir is going to be very noisy. The T2, you know, for, you know, a lot of times you'll get kind of um, motion or, 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 or other artifact, pulsation artifact um, that can kind of uh, make it difficult to see if any signal there is real. So it's really important to correlate between uh, the different sequences here. Um, Depending on how good the uh, acquisition is, you may, you know, co need to correlate between the, you know, the um, more like GRE sort of sequence and the T2 for assessing the intraspinal anatomy and cord signal. Um, this this can also help you uh, get a sense if there is in the setting of trauma or any hemorrhage, um, and also to you know to see uh, to help sort out between. Um, you know, pure disc abnormalities and disc osteophy abnormalities in particular. All right, so that basically covers um, like the approach to the non-conscious exam. In the in the setting that you're looking at a post-contrast sequence as well, typically you'll go do, perform a full search search pattern through the anatomy as 
you know, detail for the non-contrast sequences and making sure that you correlate any post-contrast um, with the pre-contrast you want. And most of the, you know, a, a large proportion of the exams we do are non-contrast like you see here. And so just as an overview for what we have covered here uh, for the approach to the MRI cervical spine, basically, as with all studies, you're getting a sense of what's going on with the patient, why you're being you're doing this particular imaging study, looking at priors, correlating you know, across prior CT, MRI, uh, any other sort of modalities, even PET CT as needed, um, ultrasound even for focal, you know, focal abnormalities. And then we're gonna take a look, uh, you know, in a, in the organization I use from an outside in approach. We're gonna look at the extraspinal anatomy, the you know soft tissues of the neck, the areas of the digestive tract, the upper um, or the upper aspect of the study, which includes the lower uh, the the you know skull base, the posterior fossa, the cella, all these sorts of things. And we're gonna take a look at the incidentally umber uh, imaged upper chest. You're gonna take a look uh, through the um, kind of stir or fluid sensitive sequence for edema, injury, marrow placement that produces edema. And then we're eventually gonna look um, at the spinal alignment, at the anatomy. We're gonna look for um, abnormalities of uh, vertebral body height and of the other aspects of the vertebral body uh, of, of the vertebra for injury, for malformation, for abnormalities or morphology. And then we're gonna look at basically the impact of all that path, uh, of any pathologic findings we're finding um, on you know, uh, on, on the patency of the spinal canal and the nerve foramina, any impact in exiting nerve roots on the cord itself. And then ultimately, we're going to look at that intraspinal anatomy. Uh, we're going to be careful to look for, uh, you know, any mass lesions, any collections, and, and then any sort of mass effect on, on the cord. And then we're going to look at the cord signal. And then ultimately, if we do have post-conscious images, we're going to perform a similar search pattern through those.